We've just got a couple of technical issues so that we can get our live stream working. So uh, once we've got that going, we will make a formal start. But hopefully now when we come to that song, you'll know that better uh, and we'll be able to sing it wholeheartedly. Uh, Rich is going to give me a thumbs up when we're ready. Very good morning, welcome. So lovely to have you all here this morning. Um, my name's John Herring, pastor here at Grace Church Leatherhead, and later on Chris Dyer is going to be preaching for us from the book of Judges. Um, he's been taking us through the whole book of Judges. We're getting close to the end now. We're in chapters 16 and 17, and he's gonna be opening those up for us uh, later on. But first, I'm gonna read some scripture to us. This is from 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verses three to four. When one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise, on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. And then 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to watch a, a short video uh, as we begin our time together. Richard, have you got the video up there? Yeah, it's, it's on the desktop. great thankfulness that we remember Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, who served so faithfully. 
As Britain's longest reigning monarch, the majority of us have never known a time when Queen Elizabeth II has not been on the throne. She has been a constant presence in an ever-changing world. When she was 10, her uncle, King Edward VIII, abdicated, and her father became King George VI. In 1947, the Queen married Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and they were married for 73 years. The Queen had four children, eight grandchildren, and 12 great-grandchildren. She saw many Prime Ministers come and go. Although the Queen was a world leader, she was consistently kind, hard-working, and respectful. She bestowed honor on those who made great contributions to society, but she also paid tribute to ordinary people whose work went unseen and unrewarded. The Queen carried out her duty to her country cheerfully and faithfully. The Queen was also a Christian and was always open about her faith. Six months before her coronation, she asked the people of the Commonwealth and the United Kingdom to pray for her, that God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises I shall be making and that I may faithfully serve him and you all the days of my life. God has certainly answered these prayers throughout her reign. In her 2002 Christmas Day broadcast, she said, I know just how much I rely on my faith to guide me through the good times and the bad. Each day is a new beginning. I draw strength from the message of hope in the Christian gospel. In 2014, she called Jesus her inspiration, role model, and anchor, who stretched out his hands in love, acceptance, and healing on the cross. Jesus is the king of all kings and queens, the ruler, reigner, and creator of the whole world, yet he came to serve, not to be served. In 2011, the Queen spoke of our need for salvation from our recklessness and our greed. She said, God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher nor a general, important though they are, but a saviour with the power to forgive. We will forever be humbled and inspired by her determination to dedicate her life to her throne, her people and her God. We honour her for her years of service, devoted to both her country and God, and we thank Jesus, the King of all, for our Queen who served her King. So this morning we gather together following a huge week in our nation's history. It uh, began with a new Prime Minister, with uh, Liz Truss on Tuesday, uh, and then with the very sad passing of our wonderful monarch, Queen Elizabeth, on Thursday, and therefore the beginning of the reign of King Charles II. And so we have much to bring before the Lord in prayer today. Sorry, King Charles III. Got to get it right. It's new, isn't it? Queen Elizabeth was the only monarch that most of us have known. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think I often took her for granted. Um, as Christians, she was the monarch that we pray for, wasn't she? A monarch who loved the King of Kings. A monarch who in her life sought to serve and lead, mirror, mirroring his own servant leadership. And as we've heard people reflecting on the news about her life in recent days, we've regularly heard people saying things like, she ruled with such grace, she represented great morals, she was a true servant. She was a constant in our lives. She represented a sense of eternity. Well, it was her faith that rooted and bore the fruit of those comments. Her faith orientated her life. She lived her life relying on her saviour and seeking to follow him and his model. And she trusted that come her death, she would see him face to face and live a life eternal that is far more privileged, precious and beautiful than even she ever enjoyed on this earth. 
apparently once uh, when one of the Queen's chaplains had been preaching on the second coming, on the return of Jesus, the Queen apparently said, Oh, how I wish that the Lord would come in my lifetime. The chaplain asked why. And it's recorded that the Queen replied with quivering lips and her whole countenance lighted up by deep emotion. I should so love to lay my crown at his feet. She was a monarch who truly knew that there was a greater king one in whom is found true life we have prayed and sung many times God save the Queen haven't we well he did God saved the Queen and she is with him in glory now praise the Lord for that and so we must now pray for our new monarch King Charles he spoke of his faith in his first address to the nation as King And we must pray that that faith would be a genuine, living, and active relationship with Jesus, as his mother's was. Every time we sing the national anthem, wherever we might be, let's make it a prayer. Let's pray that he would indeed be saved as well, and lead us as his mother did, in mirroring his servant king. Let's have a moment of quiet now. Let's give thanks for the life of the Queen. And let's lift up to our Prime Minister and our new King to the Lord, that they would know him in a living and active relationship. Let's have a moment of quiet first as we do that. In God's word, 1 Timothy 2, it says this. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Father, we do indeed lift up our King to you now. We lift up to Liz Truss and ask, Lord, that they would be people who know you. We don't know where they sit in relationship with you at the moment. We thank you that uh, that King Charles uh, proclaimed that he has faith, that he has grown up uh, going to church, hearing your word proclaimed. And we do pray, Lord, that he would have a living and active relationship with you. We pray that indeed you would save the king. We pray too that you would save our prime minister, that you would save many in government, that they would lead in a way that enables us to live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And that through that many would come to know you as they see uh, a monarch servant-heartedly leading as our last monarch did. We praise you for her life. We thank you for the way that she did indeed mirror your servant-hearted nature, that she took opportunity to speak of you, to read of your word when she uh, addressed the nation. And as those are repeated on our TV screens, we do pray, Lord, that you would speak to many, that many would be saved. On Timothy 6.15, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. And maybe you might like to join me with the words of the Lord's Prayer uh, in the more modern version. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. 
Amen. Let's now stand and sing and worship the King of Kings uh, with our, our late king's, uh, queen's uh, favourite hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. I do think this time gives us great opportunity to speak of the Lord with uh, our late Queen's faith being such a prominent thing in her life. Uh, she always wanted to speak of him when given the opportunity. Uh, so we can bring that into, into conversation, can't we? As inevitably, lots of conversations are going to be had about the Queen's life. Let's make sure we're speaking uh, about the joy that she had of faith and she's now with her Saviour. Let's uh, take opportunity to do that. Just a few bits of church family news as we continue our time together. Um, tomorrow night, uh, youth group is beginning uh, again, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, I'm sure we're all excited about that. Uh, Hugh will be hobbling along, uh, I hope, and uh, amongst others, <laughs> with his cast on. Um, so that's at 7 p.m. to 8:30 p.m. at Ashted uh, Baptist Church, just up the Barnetwood Lane Road. If you um, I don't know where that is, and if you've not been before, uh, then please do come and speak to me, and we'd love you to join us there. Um, Next, no not next Sunday, two Sundays time, 28th of September, we are planning to have a church family lunch. Um, there's no one in after us uh, for the next month or so. So after the service next week, we'll tidy things away, sorry, two weeks time, 28th of September, we'll tidy things away, we'll get some tables out. It'll be a bring and share lunch. Uh, so we'll send around some instructions before then about what to bring. Uh, but there's always plenty of food uh, and it'll be a great time to hang around in some extended fellowship get to know each other. Lots of us are new here, so it'd be great to spend some time together uh, in fellowship on the 28th of September. Those of you who are on WhatsApp will have had a, a, a few messages this week. Um, in the summer, a few of us youth families uh, went away for a camping trip, and it was such fun. We had such a good time that we thought we'd like to do it again next year, but we thought we can't just hog it to ourselves. We would love to uh, open that out to the rest of the church family. So next August bank holiday weekend, on the Sunday through to the Wednesday, um, we have booked out a, a whole field uh, on a camping site. Uh, what's it called? It's called Hayfield. Hayfield. 
So the link field is the, is the campsite, and we've booked out the hay field on that. If you'd like to know more about that, Susie Dean is kind of overseeing that, and we would love to fill that field with Grace Church Leatherhead uh, folk. Um, and you can just phone the campsite, uh, tell them it's the Grace Church Leatherhead booking, and um, they will uh, give you a, a, a plot on that field. Um, next week, uh, we are going to have an opportunity to give to the, to the ministry of Nor Ministry. Um, every, every other month we have a, a special service dedicated to a particular ministry and next week will be, next week for this month will be Nor Ministries, uh, which is Sajida's work in Pakistan. Uh, if you don't know much about that, uh, then please speak to Johnny and Rachel, they are our mission champions. And next week we'll hear a bit about that and there will be an opportunity to give as the bag will be handed around. So do please bring uh, some cash with you. Of course you can also give uh, directly into the bank account. Um, but we will um, yeah, have a special time next week to hear a bit about that work. One other thing to say is that uh, Sunday, sc um, Sunday school is up and running uh, as of last week, so that will be happening later on in, in the service. But we do have a creche, uh, and at any point, if you do want to go out there, feel free to use that space, but you are welcome here uh, to, to worship with us at the beginning of this service. Great. Okay, Chris is going to be preaching in a, in a moment, but first he would like the children to come down the front and he is going to let you know what he is going to be talking about later on. So children, please do come and fill these benches and Chris is going to speak particularly to you. That's it. Come down the front, fill up those benches. <laughs> Okay, I want you to think about a question. Let me go to the, the next one. See if this is going to... There we go, we, we're working. There we go. Now, is there anywhere in your home where you're forbidden to go? Oh, straight away, it's two boys. Have a think. Anyone else? Anywhere that you're not allowed to go? Yeah, where can't you go? <laughs> Where can't you go? Uh, the attic. The attic. Great. And you too. So you're both not allowed in the attic. Uh, I'm not allowed in the attic without permission. Okay, without permission. So you have to have permission to go up into the attic. So there's some rules from the parents. You're not allowed up in the attic. Uh, are you allowed in the in the garage? Some t yes, sort of. Okay, anywhere else? Anywhere else? Are you allowed to go everywhere? Yeah, everywhere? Everywhere? You can go everywhere you want in your house. No? Not in the roof? No, yeah, so you can't go to the attic either. Okay, so there's a rule, obviously. Parents don't let you up in the room. Okay, so, when I was younger, in my granddad, nan and granddad's house, they had one of these, which is, I think, the same as what you're saying. It's the, it's the way up to the attic. And I was not allowed to go up there and I couldn't even ask there was something really good up there by the way something really good up there but you weren't allowed to go up there and my granddad wouldn't let me up I wasn't even allowed to ask to go up there I had to I had to hint that I would like to go up there but I couldn't say I wanted to go up there otherwise I couldn't go and I had to eat now, none of you have to do this now, because uh, your parents are all soft. But I, I had to eat every single bit of my dinner before I was allowed to go up there. Everything. Not, not one more mouthful. I had to eat everything in my dinner. And what would happen if I did that? So my granddad would get, um, he'd get this stick, and he'd pull down. There'd be a ladder like that. And he would pull it down, and there was something amazing up there. Because at the top of the stairs, there was a train set that you have never seen in your life. It was brilliant. It was all, all electric controlled. You could control the, the, the trains with the little electrics. And, and my granddad would tell me what I could do. And I could move the trains around. It had a turntable like that. So you could turn the trains around. You could disconnect the carriages. You could go in a tunnel. And there was even one train that had steam that came out the top of it. And you could, you could see out the tunnel, the steam coming out, and then the train would come out. So it was amazing. But I was forbidden to go there, okay? So I wasn't allowed unless my granddad said I could go there. Now, in Israel, this 
is what's called the tabernacle. It was basically a very special tent. But they used to have this big tent. And what this tent was about was God had come to be with his people. But there's a forbidden place in that tent. So I don't know if you can see. Uh, that far, oh, we got a little, a little, you see that? That bit there? Right at the end? Yeah? That place there is called the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies you were not allowed to go into. So there's a big um, curtain there. You're not allowed. It's forbidden. No one's allowed in there. Because that's where God's holiness was. And you know what? We as humans can't go somewhere that's holy. Now, once a year, the high priest would go in there to make sacrifices for sins. But basically, they weren't allowed in there. Okay? But... My granddad let me go to the forbidden place, right? Jesus does something very special on the cross, okay? Because what happens when he dies? Here's a verse. When Jesus is dying on the cross, with a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. That means he died. And it tells us, look at that, the curtain of the temple, that was what, what the tabernacle had become, the temple, that the holy place, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. So we can now go to the forbidden place, to the holy place, because of what Jesus had done. Okay? So, we were forbidden, but now through Jesus we can go to the holy place. Right, let me pray for us, and then um, we're going to do something else. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died on the cross, and that you made a way to the forbidden place, Lord, to the place where you were holy and we were sinful, and that on the cross, by dying, you made it possible for us to go where God was and to be with him. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. We ask um, that we would remember that today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, and we're going to sing again. We're going to sing in Christ alone. So please do stand when the music begins. Oh
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, thankful that you alone are our steadfast rock. In the loss we all feel following the death of our beloved Queen, we are comforted and deeply blessed by the knowledge that you are our great eternal King who reigns forever and ever, and it is in the security of your never-ending care that our true hope and security lies. We praise you because you are awesome in your holiness, perfect in your goodness, and spotless in your beauty. And we thank you for sending your Son to defeat death for us, so that all who trust in you can enjoy you forever. We thank you that this is the truth that our Queen built her life around. We thank you for the faith you gave her, which enabled her to give her life to your service. And now, as she casts her crown before you, to rest in your everlasting arms forever. We thank you for the model she gave this nation and the world of humility, integrity and duty. Thank you for the wisdom she get, you gave her to use her days well, to be a force for the peace, truth and love that come from you. Thank you for the boldness you gave her to speak words that point to Jesus as the true King and Saviour of the world. And thank you too for the strength and quietness of heart you gave her, not to speak out in times of conflict and personal hurt, but instead to model the beautiful path of grace and forgiveness. We pray for her family, now deeply mourning her loss, that as they reflect on the life she lived, that they would be drawn to know personally the great king that she served, who gave her such wisdom, peace and joy. We pray now for King Charles, and thank you for his acknowledgement of his need for the help of the Almighty God for the role that lies before him. Might you give him your help, we pray, and more than that, give him yourself, as you water any seed of faith in his heart, that he might grow in his knowledge and love of you. We pray for Prince William and Harry and their wives, and ask for their hearts too to be drawn to you. As they hear your word in the many services they watch and attend, and remember it on the lips of their grandmother, might it pierce their hearts and cause them to turn to kneel before your throne. And we pray that as so many thousands of people both here and around the world reflect on the life of the Queen, that you would use this moment to cause many to put their trust in Jesus. We want to pray too for our new Prime Minister Liz Truss and ask that you would equip her for the task of leading the UK. As she steps into this role, might she too feel her need for your help and your wisdom. Would you give her a heart that rightly fears you, that she might govern for the true good of our nation, and that we as your people might continue to live quiet and godly lives? There are so many terrors that our world faces too big for any monarch or minister to solve. Yet we come with our prayers to you, our God who reigns over all, confident that you have the power to do impossible things. And so we pray for an end to the war in Ukraine and for a restoration of peace for this nation. We pray for Myanmar, where the military have seized control and caused such devastation. Please would you bring an end to violence and a re-establishment of justice. We pray particularly for the many Christians there who have had to flee for their lives. Please provide for their physical needs and keep their hearts trusting in you. Please forgive us, Father, for when we shut our eyes to the needs of our Christian brothers and sisters like these around the world, when we forget to pray for them, or when we pray but do nothing to help. Help us instead to follow the great pattern you set, which our Queen emulated, of using our privilege and power to serve not ourselves but others. Help us to faithfully partner with our mission partners, being prepared to sacrifice our time and money in order to encourage and bless them in their ministries as you lead us. We pray particularly for the new cat venture that you would use the life skill sessions that Richard and Jenny are starting to be a great service to our local community and ultimately to bring people to hear of you. We pray for all those in our church family facing difficulties or challenges for your hand to be upon them. We lift up to you Norman and Shirley with the health issues that they face and we ask that you would give them strength. We also lift to you Toby Davies and ask for you to bring full healing to him from the health challenges he faces at the moment and that through them he would learn to trust you more. And we pray for Hugh for the swift healing of his leg and for you to bring unexpected blessing through this time of frustration. We thank you again for the gift of little James to Charlotte and Dan and ask that you would bless and protect them all in these early days. 
We lift all of these prayers and petitions to you. In the name of Jesus, our faithful King. Amen. Now we're going to sing again to our triune God as we sing Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. time for the children to head out to their groups uh, and I'm going to pray for them as they head out and for those of us who remain in here uh, that the Lord would speak through his word and as uh, they get involved in activities around his word let's pray that uh, the Lord would speak to every one of us let's pray now Heavenly Father we praise you and thank you for the power of your word and we thank you that by your spirit you speak to hearts. We do pray you would speak to every single heart this morning, that you would soften our hearts, that your spirit would speak truth to us, that we would see that you are the one true King of kings, Lord of lords, our God almighty, that you have made a way for us to know you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to open your Bibles to follow the passage that uh, Chris will be preaching from this morning, it's in the book of Judges and chapters 17 and 18. So the book of Judges, near the beginning of the Bible, continuing on from uh, the story of Israel without a king. Judges, chapter 17. There was a man in the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, The 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears, behold, the silver's with me. I took it. And his mother said, 
Blessed be my son by the Lord, and be restored the eleven hundred pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son, to make a carved image and a metal image. Now therefore I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took two hundred pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image and it was in the house of Micah and the man Micah had a shrine and he made an ephod and household gods and ordained one of his sons who became his priest in those days there was no king in Israel everyone did what was right in his own eyes now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah of the family of Judah who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I am going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, Stay with me and be to me a father and a priest and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and your living and the Levite went in and the Levite was content to dwell with the man and the young man became to him like one of his sons and Micah ordained the Levite and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah then Micah said now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as priest. Chapter 18. In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in, for until then no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of the tri their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtael, to spy out the land and to explore it. And they said to them, Go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. When they were, there, <coughs> when they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. And they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What's your business here? And he uh, said to them, this is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. And they said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, Go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Then the five men departed, departed and came to Laish, and saw the people who were there, how they lived in security, after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth, and possessing wealth, and they, how they were far from the Sidonians, and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtel, their brothers said to them, What do you report? They said, Arise, and let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And you will, <coughs> and will you do nothing? Do you not be slow to go, to enter in and possess the land? As soon as you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. So six hundred men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtael, and went up and encamped at kiriath Jearim in Judah. On this account, that place is called Mahanan Dan to this day, because it is west of kiriath Jearim. And they passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim, and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone to scout out the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there are an ephod, 
household gods, a carved image and a metal image. Now therefore consider what you will do. And they turned aside there and came to the house of the young Levite at the home of Micah and asked him about his welfare. Now the six hundred men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. And the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered, and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, while the police, priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the six hundred men armed with weapons of war. And when these men <coughs> went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, and the household gold and the metal image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? And they said to him, Keep quiet. Put your hand on your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be a priest to the house of one man or to be priest to a tribe and clan in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household goods and the carved image and went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they had gone a distance from the house of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out, and they overtook the people of Dan, and they shouted to the people of Dan, who turned round and said to Micah, What's the matter with you, that you come with such a company? And he said, You take my gods that I made, and the priest, and go away, and what have I left? How then do you ask me, What's the matter with you? And the people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you, and you, loo you lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. But the people of Dan took what Micah had made, and the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish, to a people quiet and unsuspecting, and struck them with the edge of the sword, and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer, because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. Then they built the city, rebuilt the city, and lived in it. And they named the city Dan, after the name of Dan their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his priests, sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he had made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. Before Chris comes to open that passage up for us, we're going to sing again. Let's uh, use this song to prepare our hearts as we come before God's word. Who, O oh Lord, can save themselves?
quickly pray for us and then we will uh, get stuck into that passage. Lord and Father, we pray now that as we look at your word and we remember that uh, all scripture is God breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking and helping us. Lord, that we would listen to what you have to say to us, that we would be humble and you would teach us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So which of these statements do you think best describes the way you've just lived uh, your past week? Not not which is the right answer, because I know a lot of you will go there. Which of these statements best represents the way you've lived your last week? So, um, I haven't really thought about God at all. He wasn't on my mind. Maybe that's an experience. Another experience, perhaps, was, uh, yes, I thought about God. I thought about him uh, when I needed him. And most of the time, I, I spent my week thinking about my things. But when I needed him, I sought him. Or what about this? Uh, I, I lived this week uh, thinking about God all the time. I tried to do what he wanted me to do. Uh, and uh, I thought about him all the time. Which is true of you? And what I'm trying to get at is uh, something like this. Uh, if, if it's like the solar system, uh, if the sun is at the centre of the solar system, uh, are, you, are you like the, the sun who sit, sits at the centre of your world and does God revolve around you? Or is God the sun and you revolve around him? Not what's the right answer, what is true for you. Now, of course, our world, it wants to put me at the centre. Uh, we live in an individualistic society. Uh, our society celebrates the me, uh, the importance of the individual. Its message is something along these lines. Uh, what, it, what is important is that you feel good, that you love yourself. I, I heard on the radio the other day uh, that someone rang up and said they need to spend some time uh, doing some self-love. They needed to do some self-loving. Uh, they hadn't done that enough recently and they needed to spend some time self-loving. We're encouraged to put the me at the centre uh, and therefore it would be little wonder if we might be tempted to put me at the centre of our relationship with God. My relationship with God is about me and what God can do for me. What is important is that God fits me that, that he thinks like me, that he's there to help me, that he agrees with my morality, whatever I believe, he must believe, that he has the same political causes as me, whatever I think is the right thing to do, he must think the same thing, that I serve him in a way that is right in my own eyes. In other words, we think of God as he uh, as we think he should be, rather than what he actually is. And that is the temptation. I think it's interesting then that that's the world we find in Judges 17 and 18. Uh, it's, a, it's a world that has what I've described as reimagined God. Uh, and don't be fooled, this world that you've just read about is a very religious world. It is really religious. But their religion is defined by what is right in their own eyes. It's also a miserable and a dark and an uncomfortable place. I, I hope you picked it up as you read it. It's not a nice world. Uh, and, and in fact, it's so not nice that most people don't... You probably haven't heard many sermons on this passage because it's not talked about much. But it's God's word to us. And if we ignore this passage, we're going to miss a number of really important and relevant issues that le and lessons I think God wants us to see. Now, just before we dig right into the passage, it's worth noticing that in Judges so far, we've been given this bird's eye view of what's going on in Israel. But this, these chapters, it's like we've gone down to ground level. 
So before we've seen what God's doing, how he's um, leading the nation, saving the nation, but now we've gone down to ground level, we're seeing the nitty gritty, we're seeing what it's like day to day life, uh, that's what's going on here. So uh, point number one, and I'm going to need my clicker, thank you John, um, I've forgotten it, thank you. Um, so point number one, let me go to it, you might have to get me started Ben, oh here we go, we're going. Go on, go for the next one. Here you go. An imagined God leads to false worship. Um, Now, I don't know if you saw uh, the Oscars in 2017. Uh, It was quite fantastic to watch. They gave an Oscar to the wrong people. They announced an Oscar and they gave it to the wrong people. They came up and they started doing speeches and it went on for quite a while. Now, this this is a picture of the audience when they worked out, like, when they announced that the wrong person had been announced. And I want you to look at their faces, and particularly look at their mouths. Uh, Matt, Matt Damon's a really good one there. Uh, uh, but you get all these girls in the front row, and uh, even, yeah, Sam Hayek. Um, they're just like, what's going on? They're, they're open-mouthed. That's what we do as humans, and we see something we can't, can't fathom. We, we're open-mouthed with it. This passage is uh, an open-mouthed passage, okay? You're meant to be open-mouthed when you see it. You're meant to think, I can't believe what I'm seeing. So I'm, so I'm going to go back to the title. Uh, we begin in chapter 1 with this man, Micah. Have a look down at the passage with me as I read it. There's a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. He said to his mother, The 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears, behold, the silver was with me. I took it. Mike is a thief. That is exactly as it sounds, what's just happened there. Mike has stolen his mum's money, and he's stolen a lot of money. This is in a little bit. He's stolen a lot of money. Uh, And it's not, I hope you notice that, it's not his conscience that makes him give it back. Uh, he's actually quite religious and she's cursed the person who's stolen that money she said cursed be the person who has stolen that money and he's thought that's me oh I'm going to be cursed I bet he, he didn't worry about stealing money but when he was going to be cursed he thought I better give it back so he, he gives his money back to her and her reaction is to say blessed be my son by the Lord this is, this is uh, kind of like how not to be a parent, basically. Um, sh- you think, surely she'll discipline her son. Surely she'll tell him off. No, my son can do nothing wrong. He's my little angel. He- he's given my money back. How fantastic. He- he- yes, he stole it, but he gave it back. A- and we should be open-mouthed about this. Can't believe this. Um, she decides, perfect opportunity. I'm going to take this money. I'm going to dedicate it to God. And again, we've got to be over the mouths, because how, what's she going to do? Well, she's going to make a carved image and a metal image. Um, I, I think of God, basically. She says, I'm going to serve God. And how can I serve God? Well, I'm going to make God. I'm going to make an image of him. I'm going to, I'm going to represent him in an image, uh, a metal image. Now, in Exodus 20, you have the Ten Commandments. In verse 4, uh, it says, God was commanded Israel... You shall not make a carved image or anything, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. God had commanded that this was wrong. What she's doing here is wrong, but she does it and she thinks she's serving God. And Micah clearly thinks he's doing so too. He takes this carved image um, and what does he do in verse 5? Have a look at it. And the man, Micah, had a shrine. He made an ephod. It's like a piece of clothing that priests used to wear. And he made household gods. So he basically adds gods to other gods. So he's got a little image of God and he's going to add him. So he has gods now. And he ordains one of his sons who becomes a priest. Micah creates a little personal God-worshipping temple in his house with his own self-made image of God, we should be open-mouthed. And it's truly incredible when you realise what Micah's name means. 
His mi- the name Micah means who is like God. Who is like God? But he has just made God. He has bo- boiled God down to a little bit of metal and said that represents God. And then when you think back to the instructions God gave to Israel about the tabernacle, the place where God had come to live with Israel, and when you realise the tabernacle had so many instructions that it had a most holy place. We looked at that with the, uh, the children. It had a, a, a special place where it had a curtain where they could not go beyond to show them that God was holy and they could not approach him. That they had Levitical priests. They couldn't, anyone can be priests. You had to be from the tribe of Levi. You had to have a, a prescribed uh, sacrificial system and the blood of innocent animals had to be sacrificed to acknowledge that God was holy and you were not and you cannot approach him your own way. When you understand that, you see what's happening here is horrific and we should be open-mouthed. In verse 7, things don't get better. We get this new character, we get a Levite. By the way, my first point is really long. I, I thought I'd say that. Uh, my second two points are less long, if you keep thinking, this is going on for ages. Verse 7, we meet a new character. Uh, he's a Levite, uh, and Micah is overjoyed when this man arrives in his house. He says in verse 9, um, where do you come from? This Levite says, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem and Judah. I'm going to sojourn, it means travel, around my find a place. And Micah said to him, stay with me. Be to me a father and a priest. I will give you ten pieces of silver a year, a suit of clothes, and you'll live in. And the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons. And Michael ordained the Levite, made him a priest. And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. And Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. So, Religious Micah can't believe his luck. He knows that priests are meant to be Levites, and a Levite's just walked past, and he's like, great, I'll replace my son, which I always knew wasn't meant to be the case, but I've got a Levite now, I'll put him in place, in my shrine, and now God, the Lord, will prosper me. He's very religious, and he thinks, I'm doing things right. I'm ticking the boxes. This is, this, is, this is making my shrine a little more official. It's a little more proper. And he kicks out his son, replaces him, and we're meant to be open-mouthed. Because surely a Levite should know he should be no part of this. He should have no part of this personal idol-worshipping shrine. But no, he jumps at the opportunity. Verse 11, he was content to dwell with a man. What a world Israel has become. Now, uh, last time I preached, uh, I mentioned that the number 11 was very important in the book of Judges. Are you all so excited that one person came up and talked to me about it? So it was uh, really something that you uh, wanted to know about. But, but the number 11 is a really important number in Judges. Judges is full of the number 11. Let me go through. Ben, you might have to go through a couple for me. There, stop there. Okay, um, the number 11 appears all over the place in Judges, again and again. Uh, so in our passage, you might have noticed there's the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken. But you get loads of other examples of where not just 11 is used, but numbers where 11 goes into that number. So you get the 77 elders with Gideon, Jair rules for 22 years. You get Delilah is bribed by 1,100 pieces of silver. Later on, we get 22,000 Israelites. And number 11 keeps appearing again and again and again throughout the book of Judges. And, and, and hopefully you realise that that's wrong. Because there's a number that we should be connecting with Israel. And that is the number 12. There are 12 tribes of Israel um, that represent God's people. But again and again, we are getting this number 11. Now let's go to the next one, Ben, uh, so we don't get too distracted. Uh, Now, why? Why does the number 11 keep coming? 
Why is it appearing again and again and again? Why not 12? Because 12 is the proper number. Well, because until chapter 17, one tribe has never appeared. One tribe that should have appeared has not appeared, hasn't been mentioned. And that is the tribe of Levi, which is surprising because Levi was the tribe whose inheritance was not the land, but it was God. And, and the Levites were given the re- responsibility of running the aspects of worship. Uh, they would be the priests. The priests were taken from the Levites. And they were meant to point, of all the tribes, to God. But 11, 11, 11 keeps happening because the Levites are nowhere to be seen. And finally a Levite appears in chapter 17. And what are they doing? They are joining with shrine worship They are joining with Micah's sins and they are not pointing Israel to God. And worse than that, we see in, I hope you noticed in chapter 18, verse 30, that the Levite man is, um, we're told who he is, he's called Jonathan and he was a descendant of Moses. So this is one of the descendants of Moses, who is the Levite, how far Israel has fallen. We should be open mouthed. And then we get these, the, the tribe of Dan arrive. You get the five, five spies. Now, now, the tribe of Dan is a very special tribe, uh, because, and not in a good way. They had been unable to capture their territory. In the conquest over Canaan, the tribe of Dan had been unable to capture the territory that had been given to them. And they appear to have given up on that territory that they had been given, that they had been allotted. And so what they do in this passage is they seek an easier inheritance. They, 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 they turn up in the north trying to find somewhere easier to capture. Tim Keller describes the Danites like this. The Danites are a picture of the weakest of those who call themselves God's people. The Danites are not good. The Danites have not trusted God to fight courageously for their land. They've given up and they've now turned up somewhere else to find an easier place to be. Notice also that they're religious. So they turn up in 18 verse 5. They inquire of God from the Levite. They want to know what God wants to think. Are they going to be successful? The Levite, this is not from God by the way. The Levite says, yes, God's on your side, you're going to be successful. How do they then behave? Well, then they uh, turn up at Micah's home in chapter 18, verse 16. Read it with me. Uh, Now the 600 men of the Danites, armed with the weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. And the five men who had gone to scour the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, and the household gods, and the metal image, while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with the weapons of war. And when these men went into Micah's house and took the carved image and all the stuff, the priest said to them, what are you doing? And they said, keep quiet, put your hand on your mouth, come with us, and be to us a father or a priest. It is better for you to be priests of the house of one man or to be priests of the tribe and a clan in Israel. And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and carved image and went along with the people. We got stealing again. Thievery. We've got the tribe of Dan have turned up. They found a religious shrine and they think, whoever has that shrine is blessed by God. So they steal it. And the priest, the Levite, who should be pointing to God, goes, this is great. This is actually better for me. They're right, these Danites. I'd rather be a priest of a tribe than I would of one man. So off they go, they they rush away. Micah chases after them with his people. And what did the Danites say, verse 25? And the people of Dan said, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you, and you lose your life for the lives of your household. They're bullies. They say, we're going to kill you if you keep speaking angry words. And so they depart, they end up in Laish, they capture that place, and they set up this carved image in verse 30 in their new home, and we are to be open-mouthed. What are we to make of this extraordinary story? Well, the author wants us to understand, so he tells us in two verses. In chapter 17, verse 6, we get a summarising statement. In those days, there was no king in Israel. 
everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And repeated again in 18 verse 1, in those days there was no king in Israel. See, the land is one of worship, but it's a worship as their hearts see fit. They worship in their own way, and they serve not the king of kings, as we've been hearing about this morning, they serve themselves. There is no king here. This is false worship, and we should see that. This is false worship. It looks like worship, but it is false. And here is the lesson for us. We may be tempted to try to recreate God as we would want him. Let's be honest, God is offensive to our world. People out there don't like some of the things you will find in this Bible. Lots of things they do not like. Will it be easier to change God? Will it be easier to mould God to our own design? To do what is right in our own eyes? But I want you to see that to do so is no worship at all. It's false worship. You are not worshipping God if you change God. You either worship him as he is, or you don't. Now, it's a huge problem in churches across our country. All of the main denominations in this country are now holding theological positions that are contrary to what's taught in God's word. And they are moving away Loads of churches now teach you that God is love, but they do not teach you that God is the judge and he's bringing judgment. God doesn't really mean that, they say. Don't read those verses. Don't look at that bit in the Bible. Don't hear what he says. Selectively pick the parts that fit with my philosophy and get rid of the bits that I don't like. But my warning and lesson to us here is that must not be so with us that we must hold on to the truth if we want to worship truly. And it is the responsibility of every believer in this room to make sure that this church holds to the truth that is found in the Word of God. So if I start preaching a message that is not in the Word of God, you must stop me. And if John starts preaching a message that is not in the Word of God, you must stop him. Or if you're having a conversation with someone who preaches something not from the Word of God, you must call it out and stop it. Because it is important. Because it is important that we worship the Lord in truth. And my prayer is that uh, our church does not become like one of those thousands of churches that are currently changing God to fit into our world. We can't change him. We shouldn't seek to, and if we change him, we do not worship him at all. That's my long first point. My next two points, much quicker. So, Ben, can we go to point two? Thank you. So, point two is this. A useless hope leads to the loss of everything. You see, the problem with a self-made, imagined God is that it cannot help you in the day of trouble. And you see that in verse 24. So, chapter 18, verse 24 Micah chases after the tribe of Dan and he shouts at them and he's angry at them and he's upset at them and he says, you take my gods that I made and the priest and go away and what have I left? How then do you ask me what is the matter with you? Micah's devastated. What a sad statement. What have I left? His false religion and my gods, that's what he says, my gods are everything to him, but they've been taken. They weren't able to stop this raid, these gods, because they're not real. They had no power. He thought he would be blessed, but he wasn't. His trust was in an imagined God, not the true God. And that's the reality of false religion. We may think it's easier to serve a God of our own creation, but ultimately they'll fail us because they don't exist and they have no power. And isn't it sad that Israel have turned from the one true, almighty, powerful God, the one who alone is the water of life, the one who has the words of eternal life, The one who made the world with the word of his power and they have turned from that to a metal image. 
The Lord brings us hope as he is, precisely because of who he is. Now Jesus informs us that there will be many religious people on the final day who will be hopeless because their worship was false. They were religious, but they did not serve the true God. This is what he says in Matthew 7. Jesus speaking, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. These are very religious people. They do stuff in Jesus' name, but they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will lose everything because their hope was false, because they did not truly worship Jesus as he was. Our only hope on the last day, our only hope of being secure is Jesus Christ. So I want you to make sure that you are clinging to him tightly, to Jesus and not some self-made religion which will fail you. If you're sat here and you're not a Christian here today, uh, well, maybe you found that you are trying to do stuff to impress God but you don't know that Christ is the only hope, then today could be a wonderful day for you if you would put your hope in the only one who is able to save. Point three, Ben, pop us on. Thank you. Only God's way leads to true worship. Only God's way leads to true worship. You see, our passage finishes with a sombre thought in chapter 18, verse 31. Have a look at it. Right at the end, it says that the Danites set up Micah's carved image that he had made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. That's talking about the tabernacle. The tabernacle was at Shiloh. This was the place that God had made so Israel could meet with him. So let us reflect on the arrogance of mankind, where God of all the nations has chosen Israel to be his. And he's made a way for them to know him. He's made a place for them to know him, to travel to, to meet with him. But they do not do it. They do not humble themselves to go God's way. They try to find another way. Their way. But of course God cannot be approached our way. For we are sinful and we are cursed and God is holy. We cannot look on him and live. We cannot stand before his holy judgment and survive. Each of us is condemned. We can't make a way to God, even if we want to try. And and in the 21st century, there's all sorts of people who will tell you, if you talk to them, I talk to some at work, I speak to them and they say all sorts of things about how you can get to God. They say all religions lead to God. Doesn't matter. Muslim, Hindu, Christian, all will reach God, they say. Others suggest it's, it's in the emotions. If you, if, you, if you feel yourself part of God, then he will know you. If you have experiences, then God will know you and you will know him. Yet other people create a God that fits with them. It talks about God couldn't possibly judge people because I don't think God would be like that. They make up a God in their own minds. Yet, Just like in the time of Judges, God has already made himself known to us. And it's only human arrogance that rejects God's way and tries to achieve our own way. Hebrews 1 verse 1 tells us this. Long ago, listen to this, listen carefully. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in the last days we're in now, He's spoken to us by his son. No excuses. 
God's revealed himself to you and me through his Son. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So not only has Jesus revealed God to us, but Jesus has done everything we need, for he has paid for our sins on the cross, made a way through the curtain. Curtain is ripped from top to bottom because God has made a way so we can now go to the holy place where God is, but only one way, through Christ. No other ways. There isn't another option. There isn't another... Muhammad won't get you there. The Hindu gods won't get you there. Christ alone will get you there because he has made a way through the curtain, through his blood. That's the only way. Through the blood of Christ. No point trying to be religious. Peter talks to the religious leaders of his time. He talks to them about Jesus and he says this to them in Acts 4. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. They are the builders. They've rejected the keystone which has become the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. They've rejected him. They're trying to find another way. There is no other way. And Peter says this to them, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No name is given, no other way, Christ alone. Jesus is the way. He's the only way to God. Not only because God says so, because he's the only way. It's the only way it's possible. And so our call as a church is to serve him in spirit and in truth. That means to humble ourselves. That means to listen to everything he says in God's word, even if it makes us uncomfortable, even if we find it clashes with our culture. Let's not create a self-made God, because you cannot do that. And as Christians, let's just think about those first questions I asked you. How do we orientate ourselves in the way we live our lives? Is Christ at the centre of our lives and do we live around him and do things his way and look to him? Or are we going to continue to live our way and just go to God when we need him? Surely, surely, we must realise that it is better by far to put Christ at the centre to realise he is the power and the love of God revealed to us and to centre our lives around him. It is the way and it is the only way. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for this passage that shows us that it is so easy to make a self-made religion. It is so easy to make you something that you're not and then to worship something that is not God Lord that we would humble ourselves below you to know that you have revealed yourself through your word and through your son the Lord Jesus Christ to know that you are the only way to salvation and you have made that way for us and that we would take that way most gracious Lord that you have provided for us I pray as we leave this room we would think about those things that we would orientate our lives around you, uh, that we would take that call seriously, or that we would not live our own lives our own way and come to you every now and then. But our whole lives would be, what is your will, O Lord? How could we serve you? And we would follow that way. We do ask for your help in this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our final song now. So it's the song we sang at the start of our service. And just, uh, if we could, can we get the verse up, Ben, of the first uh, verse of that song? So really good words for what we've just said, uh, seen. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone. Christ alone. What is our only confidence? that our souls to him belong. Let's stand and sing.
great encouragement and challenge from Chris uh, from the word of the Lord in Judges 17 and 18 there that God has revealed himself to us hasn't he and it's not for us to make him in our own image we're to trust him in his word and to trust him alone in Christ alone those words again from 1 Timothy 6 15 he who is the blessed and only sovereign the king of kings and lord of lords who alone has immortality who dwells in inapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see to him be honor and eternal dominion amen